canopy opportunities in Massachusetts. Okay, sorry. So our agenda today, uh, we'll first get, uh, I will give a little overview of the Green Communities Program. We'll then get uh, introduction to the LBE program from uh, Andrea Hassanias, the LBE group. Uh, we'll then uh, hear from Francois Attal and Taylor Leiden at Solaire uh, about uh, different kinds of solar canopies uh, that can be installed. Uh, then Joey Demidio with the LBE team will talk about solar canopy financing. We'll turn it back to Andrea for grants opportunities, and then we'll hear about a specific case study at Bristol Community College from Brian Tracy with Power Option. And then uh, Julian will close us out with next steps uh, before we take your questions. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website in approximately 48 hours. Um, you are also a reminder, if there's a specific slide you might want to take a photo of to have for reference later on, there is a camera icon on the top right uh, corner of the uh, webinar box, which will be on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to use that icon to take a photo of any slides with the presentation you might want to have as a reference point for later. Um, you can also, to ask questions at the end of the webinar, use the Q&A icon um, to type in questions. This is at the bottom of the webinar box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and this slide presentation uh, will be posted to our website, uh, likely within about two weeks' time, as well as a, a typed up uh, Q&A for your reference. Okay, so let's get started with our uh, first poll question today. We'd love to get a sense of who is in our audience. Um, we'd like to know, are you a state agency, a college or university campus, a municipality, a solar uh, industry or utility poll person, or uh, somebody else? So just take a minute and vote. We've launched our poll for you. Okay, with uh, about 85% of those voting, we've got 16% uh, of state agencies, 15% of college and universities, 30% municipalities, 25% solar industry and utilities, and 15% other. Great. That was Charlie Tuttle, our webinar technician. Um, so with that, just give a little bit of an introduction to the Green Communities Program. So the Green Communities Division at DOER is the energy hub for all Massachusetts cities and towns, um, not just designated green communities. Uh, and our division works with uh, municipalities on various renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, providing uh, technical assistance and resources to be able to how, understand how best to go forward with these projects. Uh, there's a number of resources that the Green Communities Division offers. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see them up here on the screen. They can all be found on our website. You'll see the link at the bottom of the screen for your use on any kind of renewable energy and energy efficiency work. And with that, I will turn it over to Andrea. Thank you, Emma. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview on the Leading by Example program and um, some of our progress to date as we um, go into this solar canopy webinar. Um, so the Leading by Example program, also known as uh, LBE, was put into place in April 2007 as part of an executive order, 44. And in this executive order, we have short, medium, and long-term goals for state agencies. And um, this includes state agencies, community colleges, state universities, the UMass campuses. Um, and authorities are welcome to join as well. Um, so these short, medium, and long-term goals include greenhouse gas reductions, energy reductions, renewable energy targets, water conservation measures, and we have targets for uh, 2012, 2020, as well as 2050 to try to reach our 80% uh, greenhouse gas reductions by 2050. Some of these other things that come out of the executive order are a, leading, uh, a lead plot plus, standard uh, for all new construction. This means that 
we're trying to really ramp up our LEED Plus, um, getting energy reductions for over 20 percent for our new buildings, and uh, as well as having uh, large and small facilities undergo retrofits and different energy conservation measures, we look towards innovation. So just to get a broad picture of what we deal with with leading by example, we have over 80 million square feet of buildings, and that includes over 3,000 light duty vehicles, 50,000 50, computers, and a multitude of gas and electric accounts. As uh, state facilities, we use over a billion kilowatt hours a year, and overall we're, we're emitting over 1 million metric tons of, car of carbon equivalent, CO2, CO2E equivalent. Sorry, um, and a little bit of our progress to date, we had a progress report released this past fall 2014 and we've detailed uh, the amazing progress that we've done since about uh, 2004 to 2007 up to date and in this we talk about how we met our 25 percent emissions reduction goal for 2020, sorry, 2012. Uh, we talk about how we've reduced our heating oil consumption by 72% since 2006. And one another amazing metric that we have is that we've built over 37 LEED certified buildings at the state. And this includes one platinum building and 25 gold LEED buildings. One of the amazing progresses that we've had to date in terms of solar, which applies to this webinar, has to do it, in 2006, we started with about under 100 kilowatts of installed solar, and to date we have over 8 megawatts of installed solar at state facilities with an additional 3 megawatts that should be coming up online by the end of fiscal year 2015. So with all this solar that we've done so far, we, we want to push to do some more solar, and we've really exhausted a lot of the best roof and ground sites that we have in, at state facilities. and as we look forward, we were thinking, well, about 40% of all these sites have pavement that are just parking lots. And that just shows us we have great potential for large-scale solar systems, particularly over these parking lots, which is where canopies come in. We think that um, we can install roughly over 50 megawatts of possible solar canopies at state facilities, and many of these could be um, community colleges, state universities, or just large visitor centers that have large lots that might um, benefit from having a solar canopy for multiple reasons. Um, because it, people can enjoy the green space around without having to have a solar, can a solar installation that's ground mounted. It can help with um, reducing the urban heat effects that these pavements are just heat sinks for. It also uh, help keep the cars that are underneath in a more comfortable environment. So it, it produces this premium parking, if you if you like to think of it, for these cars that are underneath the solar canopies. So we see a lot of benefits to these solar canopies at state facilities. Okay, so with that, thanks, Andrea. We'll move on to our second poll question. Uh, for public entities on the call, have you previously considered the installation of a solar canopy? Uh, so we'll just give you the, a moment to go ahead and vote. Okay, with about 60% uh, folks voting, we've got 70% uh, of that group says yes, 25% says no, 5% is not sure. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Taylor Leiden and Francois Tell from Solaire to do the new, um, the, the next part of our presentation that has to do with just overall solar canopies and how to how to think about installing solar canopies, what things you should consider. Um, 
with your parking lots and your different sites. Yes, hello. Um, this is Francois Atal and uh, Telelighton from Solar Generation. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, very good. So, uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank uh, the, the DOER for organizing this very useful um, workshop on solar canopy. Um, so let, let me uh, give you a little bit of background of who we are and what, why we think solar canopies are such a great thing and the, the different types of canopies that um, we, we have designed and we think uh, are totally appro appropriate and relevant for the mass market, Massachusetts market. Um, next, so here's the agenda, uh, a little background on solar, solar generation, um, then move on to um, what solar carports are really about the different types of canopies. Uh, some of the features we have, we have added to our canopies to really um, uh, be an integral part of, of a development, of a deployment in Massachusetts. And then some uh, optional features and enhancement to canopies. Um, so next, um, I think I'm, I, I can move. Yeah, very good. So Solaire was founded in 2008 and um, the, the idea was to transform the parking lot into a beautiful power plant. Um, our first project was 2010 with Johnson & Johnson, a megawatt project, and they loved us so much that we came back for about uh, an additional four megawatts. Uh, since inception, we've built about 55 megawatts of project. Uh, we have another something in the order of 15 to 20 megawatts to build till December 2016, um, and some of the highlight um, I, I've been uh, a, a large project at the university in the Northeast, which is Rutgers University. It's eight megawatts. Just give you a scale, eight megawatts is about 3,000 cars covered in, in one single parking lot. Um, and then uh, been uh, pretty active in the corporate market with installations that, such as Munich Re, Johnson Johnson, as I mentioned, and Verizon and been uh, done a lot of deployment as well for the federal government and in particular for the Department of Defense. So uh, quite a bit of installation for the, uh, at Camp Lejeune in down in, in North Carolina. Uh, we, are, we, are, we have a nationwide presence um, started in New York City uh, to um, uh, address the New Jersey market, uh, have a presence in California since last year and opened an office in Boston this year uh, with one of our key people moving to Boston to, uh, to really uh, serve a market that has been very good for us. Um, and all because of the DOER and all the effort they've done towards um, granting better incentive uh, for carports. Uh, here's our Massachusetts experience. Uh, we've built uh, one, two, three, uh, about seven projects already. Um, so Chronix Market uh, at Martha's Vineyard, Staples uh, Headquarters, it's a garage installation and you can read it, uh, it's quite a bit of an installation. And we're about to build a fairly large installation in, in um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in Warburg, in, uh, in, in, in an area uh, close to Boston, West Boston, I can't really give you the name of the municipality, otherwise you'll know which retail mall I'm talking about. And then we, we were, um, uh, one of our partner, uh, partners was um, uh, received a leading by example uh, grant, uh, which is UMass Amherst, and we are currently designing that canopy and hope to build that canopy, uh, let's say three or four canopies, Tyler? Three canopies uh, this summer at UMass Amherst. So uh, a little bit of intro on solar carports. Um, I think uh, in, in the introduction done by uh, Jillian, correct? Um, she addressed many of those points. Uh, the pros of solar carports is that uh, currently, according, uh, under the DOER regime, uh, the, the carport receives a preferential treatment uh, on the SREC. You get full value of your SREC when you do a solar carport installation. Um, number two is what I said, and which was basically uh, uh, the, the basis of our company so to transform unused assets that are parking lot into productive power plants. Um, the huge um, value of a parking installation is the fact that parking is close to the point of consumption. So when you do a solar carbon installation, you, you, you're uh, 
your interconnection or connection to where electricity is, electricity is being used is very close, never more than let's just say 200 to 300 feet from the installation versus the solar farm which requires very long uh, wire run and cable run and a very expensive uh, interconnection upgrade. Um, it's, cardboards are an ideal alternative to roof install. Um, Sometimes people run into issues with a roof installation because the roof is too old, uh, you pass the warranty and there's some load limitation, especially in Massachusetts because of snow. Um, parking lots and also there's also a fair amount of obstacles on top of roofs such as HVAC equipment or uh, any other thing uh, you may see on the roof. Uh, the size of a parking lot is usually the is relationship with the size of the facility uh, nearby and therefore what we found out is that by covering entirely a parking lot by a nearby building with solar canopies you can serve up to 40 to 50 percent of the load of the nearby building. Um, great thing about carport is it provides quite a bit of singular benefit. It reduces the heat island effect. This is something Jillian talked about which is basically um, a, a parking lot is basically a heat sink being black and asphalt and therefore it does warm up um, nearby building. It protects individuals from the element, um, rain, snow and sun. So it's definitely, um, we, we, by installing solar canopies we provide premium parking, a premium parking environment. Um, last one, so this next one is uh, by not having sun hitting cars during the summer, you don't have to use your HVAC, your, sorry, your air conditioning in your car and therefore you can lower your uh, fuel consumption. Um, optionally, you can um, capture the water with your solar canopies and, and reuse it um, in, in your facility. Whenever we do a solar copper installation, we have to replace all the light posts um, and what we've done historically was replace light posts with LED fixtures under the canopy and that results into uh, electricity savings uh, and as well as uh, much less light pollution um, for, for, for the community. So to give you a little bit of an idea of the on-site generation capacity of solar carports, we're showing you this project which was our L'Oreal headquarters in New Jersey where there's a rooftop installation of about 100 kW and the carport installation is about 1.3 megawatts just due to the available space and especially on the roof you see the obstacle in the center of the roof um, so carports for this uh, site we're basically enabling them to install a huge amount of capacity where they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, so there are a few sites that I want to show you to demonstrate where we can install carports and what ideal sites are versus non-ideal sites. So this was, as Francois mentioned, our first project was at Johnson & Johnson in New Jersey. This is an aerial view of the site before we installed the parking canopies. So just a few things I want to point out at the site. Um, there are a lot of straight rows of parking that are quote-unquote head-to-head parking rows. So that's where two cars are going to come in and park head-to-head, -head, which is a pretty typical parking configuration that you see in large parking lots. Um, in those parking rows, we would basically put a line of columns down the center of the uh, parking row and then cantilever the structure over each side covering both sides of cars. So the structures would be about 40 feet wide. Uh, so you can see the aerial view after the installation and uh, that's how the canopies were laid out. Um, and our cantilever bring over both sides of the parking room. Um, so this is a site that is not quite as optimal for parking installations. Um, with the curved parking rows, it's a little bit tricky to fit straight carports onto those. It can certainly be done, just um, 
a little bit less straightforward of an installation process and design process. And then this site, as you can see, there are a lot of parking rows that are directly next to a building or single parking rows um, that aren't fully 40 feet wide. So it just is a less efficient carport installation and certainly a place where you can't fit as much uh, solar capacity on the site. And when we say less efficient, we basically mean less, more costly. So. Yes. Um, So the, the cons of solar carports um, or things that people should be aware uh, of when they considering a solar carport installation. The solar carport installation is a real construction project. Uh, you really need to work with experienced partners who really understand construction logistic, phasing, um, and the minimal impact on the existing operation of a building. And you really need to coordinate with all the trades uh, that are involved in a, in a carport installation. So you have architect, electrician, structural engineers, electrical engineer. Uh, you need to work really closely with the local AHA. You need to work really closely with the utility company. Those are very complex projects and, and we, we want to make people aware of that um, because that, that coordination has a big impact on a successful installation and a, a, in a timely installation. Um, the, the last point is, um, is the fact that solar carports, because of their nature, because they require a lot of steel and um, quite a, f a fair amount of civil work, are much more, more expensive than a roof or ground installation. But fortunately, um, the higher cost is mitigated uh, in Massachusetts because of the, uh, the UAR incentive structure. Um, here are very briefly some of the um, key features of, of, of our canopies and what we, we, we want the industry uh, to adopt or and, um, as, as standards. Uh, very important to have your canopies to have a very high clearance, especially in public spaces and we think about school or municipality or any, 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 any other public space. You're going to have a lot of traffic and especially trucks or UPS trucks or of fire trucks and therefore you need to have fairly high clearance for your canopies. Um, two is, you know, again, it's public space so you should expect people unfortunately to um, uh, sometimes forget about the, 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 the canopy and, and run into the pier, run into the canopy and therefore you need protective piers to protect the, the canopy from impact. Um, being Massachusetts and after the last winter, um, you want to make sure that um, the snow, you, you have a way to um, manage the snow and what we, we've done is to design that our canopy was that dual tilt, we're the first one in the industry to do this and basically to keep the snow on top of the canopy uh, as opposed to have all the snow fall into people or into, or into vehicles. Um, we have also have a single tilt canopy and we, we'll go into that a little later with a snow guard at the end to prevent snow to uh, fall abruptly on two people or a vehicle. Um, must have featured again integration of lighting for safety and security um, and also uh, want to make sure and the next one is this you don't see too much of wires so we see no no wires um, in, in, in minimal um, exposure of electrical equipment in the canopy. Again, we, you want to work with qualified people, so it's qualified structure engineers and, and you want to make sure that's designed by architect or have some architect involved in the process because architects really understand how those structure, structures integrate into a public space. Um, then, you know, those structures are supposed to, um, uh, to live or have a, fly, have a life of 20 to 25 years, so really you want to make sure that your finish uh, live up to that kind of a life and 25 years is basically a, a canopy that um, is, is hot deep galvanized and it will withstand uh, a pretty harsh environment. Other features that are optional but are pretty useful and we have done a lot of those, uh, a lot of canopies with those features, uh, with water management, uh, with decking or uh, integration of electrical vehicle charger and integration of LED lights to lower, uh, lower uh, 
uh, electricity consumption. So we've talked a lot about the different features and um, kind of types of canopies, but I want to give you a better idea of what they look like and a lot of our, a couple of our installations in Massachusetts. So this is the canopy that is installed at the Cronings Market in Martha's Vineyard. It is, as Francois was talking about, it's the dual incline canopy that was designed for snow management so that the snow and ice will stay on the canopy instead of falling onto people underneath or cars and it will melt towards the center of the canopy. Additionally, this canopy has a water management system, so in the center you might be able to see the center gutter um, and some of the gaskets that are the um, black parts that are running in between the panels um, to keep them watertight. Yeah, so in order to have water management, you don't need to have necessarily to have decking underneath the, the PV panels. You can use our solution, which is a, 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 com a combination of rubber gasket and, and, and gutters. So this is another, this is the single tilt version of the Solar 360. Uh, this is an installation in Maryland, and it's definitely more prevalent in states that have less snow. Um, we can definitely do this in Massachusetts, but we would put a snow guard on the low end of the canopy to basically prevent large sheets of ice and snow from falling off. We are actually just designing right now an installation for the municipality in southern Massachusetts with snow guards. It's a single tilt. Uh, this is a long span canopy, so it, as you can tell, it's not just 40 feet wide. It covers two head-to-head -head parking rows plus the internal drive aisle. So the columns are going to be at the center stripe of each of those parking rows, and it will cover both of the rows plus the drive aisle. Uh, and this installation is at the Danversport Yacht Club in Danvers, Massachusetts. And the, the lowest clearance underneath at the drive aisle is about 12 feet. Um, and this structure is mostly intended to maximize the capacity over the parking lot. Then this is the same long span concept but on a garage top. Uh, we have seen a lot of demand for this in Massachusetts. This is at the Staples headquarters in Framingham. We also have a couple of installations at uh, Boston Properties at a corporate park there in Waltham, also at uh, Oracle in Burlington. Oracle and uh, another corporate park in Waltham. Um, then this is our premium carport, which integrates the decking beneath the panels. Uh, it's a more finished and sleek looking carport. This has been installed at a lot of corporate headquarters. Um, and, and, and this is the canopy that's going to be installed at UMass Amherst, the canopy type. Then um, this just gives you an idea of how it looks when the snow is uh, kept on top of the canopies. Um, it is no denying that having um, uh, the, 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 the V shape or the dual tilt canopy is going to keep the snow uh, on top of the, the canopy for a longer time. What we found out is actually uh, the, the snow slides a little bit and therefore some of the panels uh, are uncovered and get hot pretty quickly and we, we have pictures comparing a roof install and a solar canopy install. We see that the, the snow actually uh, goes away faster than in our, on our, from our canopies than it, it would it, it actually does from a roof insulation. Um. So this gives you a little bit of a close-up on that water management system that we were talking about. You see the central gutter um, and the gaskets running parallel to that, and then mini gutters that are running perpendicular that are bringing the water down to the central gutter and it then comes down in downspouts at each of the columns. Um, and then Francois talked about some of the other features that could be integrated into canopies, but just wanted to give you a visual of them. Um, the electric vehicle chargers are really pretty easy to integrate into 
uh, the installations either mounted on the column or as standalone bollards. Um, and so we've had a lot of people want to integrate these into their canopy installations. It's worth mentioning that the uh, electricity for the cars here isn't necessarily coming from the uh, solar canopy. It's usually a, either grid tied or tied into the, the building infrastructure. Um, the LED lights are integrated under either under the decking or under each of the canopies that we uh, typically do. And then we also have the uh, capacity to add battery storage and create microgrids, um, which is something that is becoming increasingly popular in the solar industry. This is uh, an installation that we have in Maryland um, that is a corporate microgrid at Conterra Realty. And that concludes our, um, our presentation. Thank you very much for uh, listening, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Francois and Taylor. Uh, I just mentioned that Solaire is one of uh, many vendors uh, that are based in Massachusetts, um, and they, you provided a lot of great examples of, of your projects up here. Um, my name is Jillian Demedio, and I'm part of the Leading by Example team here at DOER, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a couple options for solar canopy uh, financing. All right, so there are a lot of options out there, and I'm going to just discuss three scenarios uh, today that we see as, as good options for state agencies and municipalities. Um, the first is uh, for the entity to build and own the system and, and finance the system through uh, your own internal budget. Um, the second option is also to build and own the system, but secure outside financing. And I'll go over two options uh, for outside financing uh, with you a little later on. Um, and lastly is a third-party ownership model uh, through a power purchase agreement. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons involved with each of these options. Um, really, what you go with is going to depend on the individual circumstances of your own entity. Um, but there are a few things that you should consider when, when making this decision. Um, one is, you know, how many capital funds do you have available for an upfront cost? Um, what is your facility appetite for managing the operation and maintenance of the system? Um, you'll want to think about the status of the investment tax credit. Um, this is a 30% federal tax incentive um, offered for solar installations. Um, this is actually set to expire at the end of 2016, um, so that's definitely something you'll want to consider. Uh, and lastly, what are your timeline goals for the project? Um, depending on what your you know, resource capabilities are, um, you'll, it might skew towards one financing mechanism over another. Um, so now I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper into each of these three scenarios and talk about some of the characteristics that are associated with each of them. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the build-to-own scenario uh, and through a self-financing model, um, this is basically where you're paying for the system up front um, completely out of pocket. Um, we expect this to be through a capital budget, um, but there are certainly other means of, of self-financing as well. Um, and once once the system is operational, there are basically two revenue streams uh, that will be available to you as the project owner. Um, the first is electricity cost savings. Um, now that you're generating a portion of your own electricity, um, you're going to realize those savings on your monthly utility bills. Um, and the second is through the generation of SREX, or uh, Solar Renewable Energy Certificate. Um, each megawatt of electricity generated is going to produce one SREX. Um, which can then be sold on the ESREC market for the duration of the ESREC program. Um, the ESREC program runs from 2015 uh, through 2024. Um, and basically, once you sell these ESRECs, that is a revenue source for you, and you retain 100% of the ESRECs generated as the project owner. Um, after 2024, the ESRECs expire. Um, after that point, each megawatt of electricity generated will then um, produce one Class 1 REC. Um, class 1 RECs still have value on the market, um, but as you can see uh, in this revenue schedule, they are not quite worth as much as the SREC. Um, and then the last characteristic that I'll point out is that as the project owner, you're going to be responsible for all the routine maintenance, any repairs that come up as needed, 
And of course, the inverter replacement, which usually happens uh, anywhere from year 10 to 15. <clears throat> okay, so if you don't have a large amount of capital dollars available to you uh, to finance the project internally, um, there are two low-cost financing sources uh, that I want to talk to you about today. Um, the first is Clean Renewable Energy Bonds, or CREBS. This is a form of tax credit bond uh, for qualified renewable energy projects in which some or all of the interest is paid in the form of a federal tax credit. Um, the real benefit of this form of financing is that the issuer is able to secure a very low interest rate. Um, in the past, we've seen interest rates uh, from about 1 to 1.5%. One um, the IRS uh, has issued a number of credit allocations in the past, and most recently in February of this year. Um, they just opened up applications on March 5th, and they'll be awarding uh, funds on a rolling basis. Um, of all the funds available, about $600 million, or one-third of the total, is set aside specifically for state agencies and municipal governments nationwide. Um, as I said, we're expecting about a 1.5% interest rate, and the bond term will vary anywhere from 15 uh, to 25 years. Um, Massachusetts has taken advantage of Krebs financing in the past, and the way we've done that is to aggregate a number of state and municipal projects into one Krebs application, um, which is then sent uh, through Mass Development, which is the state's finance and development authority. Um, Mass Development then takes on the role of issuing the bond. Um, as I said, we've done that in the past, and we expect to do it that way in the future as well. A, sex, a second option for outside financing is uh, through NEEP, or the Non-Building Energy Efficiency Investment Program. Um, this is a Massachusetts general obligation bond, uh, also called a green bond. Uh, it's used to finance clean energy projects where the annual savings or revenue generated um, are then used to make the bond payments. Um, this is available to state agencies only. It is uh, run through the Leading by Example program at DOER. Um, but I should mention that you know, this is how the state has managed to finance clean energy projects. Uh, theoretically, municipalities could structure a similar program. Um, so again, this program, NEEP, uh, because the savings cover payments, uh, this type of debt is not going to affect the state's bond rating. Um, and it's also not subject to the normal uh, debt ceiling limitations of other bonds. Um, we have $15 million allocated uh, over two years, um, and this was originally set aside specifically for non-building efficiency. Um, so we were looking at subway and dam operations, outdoor lighting, um, tunnel lighting and ventilation. Um, but because of the great interest in solar canopies, as well as the great potential we see in our state, um, we are now opening this program up to finance solar canopy installations as well. Um, based on past allocations of, of green bonds, we anticipate an interest rate of about 3.5% um, and anywhere from 10 to 20 year bond terms. Uh, one thing I should mention is that um, because we're relying on the savings and revenue to make the bond payments, um, one criteria is that the project must generate savings or revenue that are at least 10% greater on an annual basis than the debt service payment. Um, because of this requirement, it is likely that uh, the agency will have to put up um, some upfront costs. We don't expect this to be huge, but probably about 20% of the total project cost. OK, so the last uh, financing mechanism is, is we're going to switch gears all together um, and talk about third-party ownership through a power purchase agreement. Um, in this scenario, the state agency or municipality um, taking advantage of a PPA will not be the project owner. Rather, they will agree to purchase all the electricity generated uh, from a system that is owned by a third party, um, owned, operated, and maintained by a third party. Um, typically, these are 20-year contracts. Um, you're going to negotiate with your, with your partner um, a fixed price per kilowatt hour. Um, and usually this fixed price is lower than what you're currently paying on your utility bill. Um, so you will realize savings immediately as soon as the project's online. Um, some of these uh, agreements are come with a, a price escalator um, over time, um, but that really depends on the terms of the contract. That may not be part of it. Um, the other thing I'll point out is because you're not the project owner, you have no O&M responsibilities, um, and you also 
don't retain any of that SREC revenue. That will go to the project owner. Okay, so I've already touched on uh, a lot of the pros and cons as I was going through each option. Um, I, you know, this is just a handy summary table. This might be a good time for you to take a picture of the screen so you can refer back to this at a later date when you're making your financing decision. Um, one thing I'll point out is, you know, it's just an easy way to remember it is, uh, in general, the more you contribute to the project up front, the greater your earnings are going to be over time. Okay, so this, this slide basically shows uh, cash flow scenarios for each of the financing mechanism once, mechanisms once applied to a hypothetical 500 kilowatt uh, system. Um, we made a number of assumptions in order to perform this analysis. Uh, obviously, actual uh, numbers are going to vary. Um, I'll just run through a few of these assumptions quickly. Um, we assumed a $3.50 cost per watt. Um, this is pretty standard with what we've seen in the industry recently. Um, and this would give this project, 500 kilowatts, a total project cost of 1.75 million. Um, we also assumed an electricity utility rate of about 16 cents per kilowatt hour, um, which is escalating at 2% a year, and a PPA rate, or power purchase agreement rate, at 11.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So you can see in the bottom, bottom table um, all, you know, how the benefits work out over time. Um, the three build-to-own scenarios are going to have the greatest earnings over time. You can see that in the, in the um, row that's in bold there um, when compared to the power purchase agreement. Uh, on the other hand, the power purchase agreement has a zero upfront cost, and it still has positive uh, cash flows uh, beginning in year one and throughout the life of the project. Um, the other thing I'll point out is with if you're utilizing CREBS or NEAP financing, um, as I've mentioned, some upfront cost is likely in order to ensure positive cash flows uh, through the life of the project and also ensure that you have a savings uh, to debt ratio um, of at least 1.1. Um, for NEEP, we expect this upfront contribution to be about 20%. Um, for CREBS, because of that lower interest rate, we actually expect that that'll be much lower. Um, I assume 20% just for the sake of this analysis, um, but you can really expect more of a 5 to 10% contribution to total project costs. So those are the a few financing mechanisms available to you. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about procurement. Uh, for state agencies, uh, if you decide to go the build-to-own route, uh, you'll have to go through a competitive procurement um, as you would with any large construction project. Um, unfortunately, state procurement laws currently do not allow agencies to enter into power purchase agreements on their own, um, but there is an exception in that they can uh, work with an energy cooperative that is authorized to act on behalf of public entities. Um, municipalities don't have this uh, restriction. Um, they are able to do competitive procurement for a built-to-own scenario or third-party ownership, or they can also, for third-party, work with an energy cooperative uh, authorized to act on behalf of public entities. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Andrea, who is going to talk to you a little bit about grant opportunities. Thank you, Jillian. Um, so the first of the two grant opportunities I'm going to talk to you is more aimed at state facilities. And we will soon be issuing a new public opportunity notice, a PON, for solar canopies at state facilities. This is aimed um, at parking lots, garage roofs, pedestrian walkways that is on state land. And we'll have about $1.5 million available in this PON. The exciting thing about this PON, it's um, sort of based on a installed watt um, amount. So if you have the total amount of kilowatts or watts that you have, you would multiply the amount of watts by 75 cents per watt if you were to do a state-owned project um, that's designed built for up to $600,000 per site, or you would receive a 50 cent per watt uh, incentive for third-party projects up to half a million dollars, which is a very considerable amount of money. So the other part of this grant opportunity is that we do have some eligibility requirements we're looking at projects that are over 200 kilowatts. That isn't to say that smaller projects can't come in with our grant opportunity, but we're, um, those smaller projects would be really more aimed at innovative ways of doing solar, solar canopies, 
or if they're tied to, let's say, a net zero building that's going to use the load from that solar canopy, something more innovative. But for the most part, we're looking for 200 uh, kilowatts or larger. We're also looking at sites to have some on-site consumption from these solar canopies. Uh, we're not looking to, to have a solar canopy over a parking lot that doesn't have any consumption at all. So if there's some street lights and parking lights, those would definitely be very helpful. Once you uh, read through the PLN, you'll find that we have a minimum amount of EV charging stations at these solar canopies. We're looking to expand the amount of charging stations available to electric vehicles. So this is uh, a great opportunity to install a couple of charging stations when you're going to put in a solar canopy at your site. And we're interested in knowing what kind of procurement option you're using, if you're using Chapter 25A or if you're using a different kind of procurement method. Uh, that's part of what we're looking for in this grant opportunity at, for state facilities. Unfortunately, this is mostly aimed at state facilities, and unlike the next one, which is for municipalities. So for municipalities, um, we'll soon be releasing, it in the next couple of months, a new PON uh, coming out in May, hopefully, that is our Owner's Agent Technical Assistance Grant, also known as ODA. And this is more towards uh, Feasibility studies more towards the technical side of uh, solar canopies. We're looking uh, mostly for these people to go in, look at sites, tell us the opportunities at municipalities, rather than using these funds to pay for actual installations. These grants available are a lot less than the state facilities one. Here we're looking at maximum grants of $12,000. And uh, the money is limited, so it's a first come, first serve basis with um, funds running out throughout time, hopefully. And with that, I would um, like to introduce our next speaker, which is Brian Tracy from Power Options. And he will be able to go over a specific case study that we have of a solar canopy at a state facility. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. My name is Brian Tracy. I'm the Director of Research and Program Development at Power Options. Um, today, I will be talking about lessons learned from the Bristol Community College a Parking Canopy Project in Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, before I get into uh, the project details um, and lessons, I just wanted to give you an overview of who Power Options is and what we do. Um, we were founded in 1998 um, when the electric, electricity industry was restructured. Um, we're the largest energy buying uh, consortium or co-op in Massachusetts. We serve um, nonprofits in Massachusetts only. We have roughly 500 members, all nonprofits or public entities, state and municipalities. Um, we do roughly $200 million in annual sales in energy supply, including electricity and natural gas. Um, and we also have a solar PPA program with about 65 megawatts of solar products under contract. Um, 10 megawatts are behind the meter projects, including regional high schools, um, public and private colleges. And then we also have 50 megawatts, roughly, of virtual net meter PPA projects um, with numerous state entities, including state colleges and housing authorities. Here's a little bit of detail, which we can sort of brush through quickly. It's just the, our solutions, which include the electricity and natural gas contract, as I mentioned. Um, they both, both are um, with our provider of direct energy. Um, and they, our contracts with them are through 2019. And our solar PPA program is with Sun Edison. Uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, we have an on-site PPA serving behind the meter uh, projects as well as the off-site uh, virtual net meter PPA for net meter and credits. And we're actually launching a small solar program as well, a small, solar, small PPA program for projects uh, in the 25 to 300 kW range. Um, and we hope to have that launched um, sometime this summer. So to give you an idea of how we're involved in this project, uh, a BCC is a member of Power Options. Um, and all our programs begin with a competitive solicitation. Um, and the process is such that it, we, we have, um, in the back up, it's actually our programs are, are offered on behalf of the Mass Clean Energy Center. And this provides uh, the procurement exemption for members, which Jillian had referenced, um, for state agencies. And that exemption includes land disposition um, under our, our enabling statute of Chapter 164, Section 137. Um, our program is we leverage the aggregation, um, the load, the, the electricity load, and also the natural gas load, um, and the membership numbers in general to yield 
very low in competitive pricing on an ongoing basis. We pre-negotiate the contracts. We have best industry uh, uh, contract terms and conditions, and, which are unique to our aggregation. Uh, we have a pricing methodology, which is set um, during the competitive process, which uh, locks in um, the pricing for the program term and ensures an ongoing competitive PPA price in the case of uh, our solar program. And, this, and the entire process allows your members to avoid the cost of solicitation and legal costs and contract negotiation, um, which benefits uh, from our expertise at Power Options. So here's the um, Google Earth image uh, of the project site at Bristol Community College in Fall River. Um, the lot is actually five different parking lots, um, which is in the south side of campus. Um, the highway to the east is, is Route 24. Uh, the campus is off Ellsbury Street there at Fall River. Um, and this is, we took this lot here um, and transformed this 800 space, six acre lot into a clean energy uh, solar PV generator. That's what's going on and we're close to completion. And I'll walk you through here the timeline of the project. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's taken uh, uh, almost two and a half to three years from sort of the inception. Uh, the proposal was generated way back in 2012, summer 2012, and we went back and forth with folks at BCC on various designs. Um, we started with one to two parking lots and sort of grew in scale. Scale is important to bring down costs and to make the most cost-effective project we, we can make it. Um, and now it covers that um, the five parking lots as, as we just showed. The PPA contract and site license was actually executed in spring 2013. Um, the net metering cap allocation application was filed at DPU in 2014. Um, this was important because the project is over three megawatts um, and relative to the size of load at the community college, it was important to get in on the uh, net metering cap uh, retail rates. Um, and this was, and to give you an idea, this was all going on when caps were hit and legislation was filed in July 2014 uh, to increase the caps. and project was able to move forward as designed at over three megawatts um, as the caps were raised. Um, the interconnect interconnection process um, is also sort of a lengthy process, and it was very lengthy due to the size of this project. Um, it's not always nine to 12 months, but this project took probably nine to 12 months to get the approval from the national grid. Um, but it, it tends to be, I would say, at a minimum six months for, for larger projects. Um, the notice to proceed on construction um, was given in summer 2014, and that's when um, things started moving and equipment was procured, um, structures were designed, site preps, um, contract and mobilization, uh, many deliveries to the site. Um, and I'll show you in various images here of what, what's happened over the last six to eight months. Um, commercial operation is due um, early next month. These photos here show uh, the east side of the parking lot, um, a couple dual incline structures. There are eight different structures on site. Uh, this was, these photos were taken in October of 14. Here is February 15, which gives you a pretty decent idea of the, of the um, size of the, of, of the entire project. This is during the various snowstorms. Um, and it's all covered in snow in Feb 2015. Um, I think you can see roughly one, two, three, five, six, about seven of the structures there. And here is another photo here taken in March 15. Um, this is, there are four long span uh, larger structures on site, and then there are uh, four smaller structures as well. Here is the most recent photo I have um, from last week. 90% of the panels have been installed, um, and this should be wrapped up in the next week or so. Um, and we can flip the switch, as I mentioned, uh, in, early, in early May. Here, this gives you an idea of the financial benefit that the school will receive from, from entering into this contract, into this PPA contract. Um, the 3.2 megawatt system will be generating roughly 3.9 million PWH uh, annually, which should um, produce savings roughly uh, roughly 20,000 in year one. Um, it increases based on a 1.5% um, utility rate escalation assumed in this. 
Um, so it goes from 20,000 up to close to 158,000 um, in year 20 for a total savings of 1.75 million over the contract term. Here's an overview of the equipment that's been installed on site to date. Uh, Rigid Global was the contractor that's provided the canopy structures. As I mentioned, there are eight different canopy buildings installed on site. The long span buildings have the 64 foot uh, wings. They're actually, I think, 80, roughly 80 feet total. They have a smaller wing, about 20 feet. Um, the heights range, uh, the lowest clearance height is 11 feet, and it goes up to 17 feet on some of the higher points. Um, the project is 3.2 megawatts uh, DC or 2 megawatt AC. There are almost 10,000 Sun Edison modules installed, modules 330s, um, which have 25 year power warranties, efficiencies of almost 17%. And there are four advanced energy 500 kW inverters as part of the project. Uh, here's the PPA overview. Um, Sun Edison is responsible for the project design, financing, and O&M for the contract term. They own the project. Uh, BCC does not own the project. Um, it, this is not a public construction project, which is sort of an important point. Pre prevailing wage law did not apply to this project. Um, so BCC's commitment to this project is buying the electricity generated from the project. Uh, there are no upfront costs. It is a 20-year deal, which is an industry standard. Um, BCC used our uh, the power options pre-negotiated PPA contract as part of this, which has a guaranteed performance provision. Um, it was a fixed price PPA. Um, note that there are reductions in utility demand charges as well. There are, it's not eliminated, but there is reduction. Um, National Grid has lower demand charges relative to other utilities in the area, such as NSTAR and Wumiko. Um, so that those are important points to consider when um, review, reviewing your proposal and your facility's needs. Um, as Julian mentioned, the SREX are owned by Sun Edison or the third party here. Um, and there are opportunities to buy the products out if that was of interest. Uh, things to know and some advice here, and this is sort of reiterating some of the, the points that folks at Solaire um, had mentioned. I mean, this is heavy construction. There was uh, schedule shifts are very common. Contractors are all over the place on site uh, for a pretty long period of time, um, and it's really disruption should be expected. There's really no way around it. It's noise. Uh, parking is, is is chaotic at some some point. It's well managed. Um, by the contractors, but it's, you know, it's, in terms of daily routines, it, they're disrupted. Um, Sun Edison, given the fact that they own the project, they have, they're on the risk for all change orders, which is a good thing um, for the customer. But in terms of advice, I, you know, I, I would clearly articulate any schedule requirements up front um, in the contract as best you, you can, as best you can project. Um, and water management needs also are very important. Water tightness um, was mentioned before. Uh, gaskets are very important to have in between the panels or decking underneath to manage, manage water or snow melts um, going forward. But those, I, you know, I just I can't make enough points to sort of make sure you're on top of those items um, before the project begins. Have frequent weekly meetings with ops folks um, and, and take the long view just because um, over the six to eight months of construction, there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of disturbance and just sort of be ready. Um, in the end, you know, this is a great project. Um, we'll have over 3.5 million kWh uh, generated annually uh, with financial benefits of 1.75 million, 1,500 tons of, of carbon um, reduced, avoided. Um, great diversification for your portfolio, supply portfolio, and great PR for the school and uh, educational opportunities. We have photos to the right is just um, a completed project we have, a um, uh, canopy project at Endicott College that was completed about 18 months ago and is working out great. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. okay. So we've got our last poll question. Uh, we'd just love to know, given what you've learned in this webinar, how likely you are to con now consider a solar canopy at your facility? OK, 
Okay, with about 65% uh, of the viewers voting, we've got 32% uh, definitely, 36% are very likely, 20% somewhat, and the 13% are still not sure. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Brian, uh, for that uh, overview of Bristol Community College, uh, their great project over there. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with a few uh, next steps, the things that we consider to be the important uh, to, move, to move this forward. Um, for state facilities, the Leading by Example team sent out a solar canopy survey. Um, if you haven't filled that out, we encourage you to do so. Um, we have had a great response to that survey. We have over 75 uh, potential lots already. Um, and kind of what we're thinking is uh, we're going to take the lead on, on narrowing these sites down based on, um, you know, to about 25 based on the highest potential. Um, and then we'll work with uh, partner agencies um, in developing an RFQ for a DOER funded uh, feasibility study. And we're hoping to kind of get that out by the end of the month and certainly uh, in early May. Um, in terms of municipalities, um, we would highly, highly encourage you to complete a similar preliminary analysis, um, kind of pick out your best sites, um, maybe consider some of the things that Taylor at Solaire talked about uh, when looking at your lots, um, what's the size, what's the shape of the, the parking orientation, um, is there a lot of shading around the perimeter, um, and then once you determine if you have a few lots to move forward with, um, maybe consider applying for that ODA grant through the Green Communities Division um, to get a more in-depth feasibility study. Um, for both state agencies and municipalities, if you do decide you want to move forward with a solar canopy, um, you'll have to decide which financing method is best for you. Um, for CREBS, we are looking to bundle a number of projects into a statewide CREBS application. Um, LBE is here to assist you in that for state agencies. Um, Mass Development has offered to uh, talk with municipalities, um, so feel free to reach out. Um, there will be a contact information on the next slide. Um, once CREPS funding is kind of used up and fully allocated, um, we highly encourage you to utilize NEAP funding um, for financing your solar canopies or considering uh, going through an authorized energy cooperative uh, for the PPA arrangement. Okay, and uh, lastly, these are just some resources and contact information for your reference. We have our program websites up there. Um, for state agencies and, and colleges and universities, uh, please feel free to reach out to anybody on the Leading by Example program staff. Um, for municipalities, we have the regional coordinator information here um, for the Green Communities Division, and then also Mass Development. Rebecca Sullivan over at Mass Development has offered uh, to answer any questions regarding CREBS applications for municipalities. Um, and with that, we're going to wrap up our webinar. Thank you all for attending. Um, now I think we're going to we have some time to address your questions. Uh, one of the main questions that we uh, see a lot of people have been asking about is in regards to parking spots, and do you lose parking spots with these canopies, and, and how do the parking, how the columns uh, deal with the parking spots, and one of the key things that we've heard from a lot of people is to count how many parking spots you have before the project and design the, par the, the solar canopy and the columns so that the column will fit on the corners of a parking spot. So if you have, let's say, four parking spots head-to-head, uh, -head, the column would be in the middle corner of that so that you don't lose a whole parking spot, but rather just a tiny, itty-bitty piece of a parking spot. And that way, when you build your solar canopy, you have the same amount of parking spots that you did before the project went in. And uh, you can work with your vendor to make sure that the layout works, but you shouldn't lose uh, any parking spots if you if designed correctly for these solar canopies. Yes, yeah, so in the history, I mean, as I said, we've done about more than 50 megawatts of installation, and uh, we can claim that we've never lost a parking spot. Um, and, and the reason for that is that uh, we have a fairly um, wide distance between the columns. We have a fair amount of flexibility in how 
where we, we land the columns. Um, so therefore, we can we, we we've been able to avoid uh, loss of parking spot. Um, does that answer the question? Is that yep, that's perfect. Um, another one of the questions that we got has to do with what's a typical capacity factor for solar canopies in Massachusetts. Um, I think that's dependent on your area. We um, sometimes use about a 13% capacity factor, but it really depends more on the specific site that you're looking at, where you are in the state, what the tilt angle is of your solar canopy, um, if it's layered with another type of, of angle. So, so that really more depends on your specific site, but we tend to go about a 13% capacity factor. In, in the example of the installation we've done, um, what we look at is um, 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 production from KWH over KW. And uh, in the research we've done, they range between 1100 to 1250, really depending on the orientation. So if you're true south and you use a single tilt at, at 7 to 10 degrees, you're going to get a high yield, a higher production. So towards 1200, 1250. If your canopy is actually facing east or west, because of uh, how the, park, uh, the parking lot is configured, um, you're probably going to run into something below 1,100 kWh per kW. Yeah, there's a question on the um, replacement of equipment and who's responsible for it uh, in a PPA scenario. That's all uh, the provider is responsible for any equipment failure or, or replacement needs. Um, it's not the positive. We also have a question on decking. Do you want to take that, Brian? Oh, the decking is, um, and so Larry can sort of follow up, but the decking has to do with it's under under the panels, um, provides sort of water management um, in the event there are no gaskets between the panels. Yeah, absolutely. So as we said, um, there's two approaches to uh, water management. One is using decking. And the other one is using uh, some, some, some gaskets and, and mini gutter. Um, and then sometimes people just don't want to see the panels. Um, and they, they, they want to conceal wires and panels. And that's why they're using decking so it's for aesthetic purpose. The construction phase um, question about how long will the facility be without parking. Um, at Bristol, there were shuttle buses um, sort of implemented to, to deal with the loss of parking spaces. And that, that had to do, the timing was such that construction began right um, in late summer, early fall, when the school was starting starting up again, and there were um, shuttle buses that were sort of taking taking over for lack of parking spaces. And it probably lasted as the foundations were installed um, and the seal was erected. It was probably a, a 30 to 60 day period. Um, and, this, and the construction was phased so that the, um, one parking lot was sort of completed at a time uh, in the, from a foundation standpoint and a steel erection standpoint. Uh, we have a question on the slides. These slides will be made available once we post them. And we do have a number of questions that we'll also be posting um, as a follow-up to answer all these questions that we weren't able to address. And with that, Emma? So everyone, thanks so much for attending another Green Communities webinar. And thank you very much to all of our presenters, both that CVR and Power Options and Solaire. Really appreciate you taking the time to provide the information. We're out of time, but uh, we did have a number of questions we were not able to answer, so please keep your eyes on our website. Uh, we'll be posting both this webinar presentation and the Q&A uh, for you to access. So with that, thanks so much for listening today. Thank you very much. Thank you.